This episode of The Human Experience is brought to you by Dot Yoga. The internet is a rapidly evolving place. One of the recent changes that you may not be aware of are the new categories of domain names that allow individuals and industries a new choice in representing their presences online. Have you heard about Dot Yoga domains? Dot Yoga is exactly like a dot com domain, except they end in dot yoga. This gives yoga practitioners, meditators, and people who enjoy having a choice in the way their online identity is displayed a new and easy way to reference their online presence. Use your dot yoga domain for your website, your email, set it up so that your fans can access your social media platforms through your dot yoga domain. It's short, easy to remember, and you yogis out there will have an instant connection between your services and the yoga community by getting your .yoga domain today. Get to www.getmy.yoga. Use code HXP2017 for 50% off. Don't be late to this party. Bring your web presence into harmony by upgrading to a dot yoga website and email address today. Welcome to the Human Experience Podcast, the only podcast designed to fuse your left and right brain hemispheres and feed it the most entertaining and mentally engaging topics on the planet. As we approach our ascent, please make sure your frontal, temporal and occipital lobes are in their full upright position. As you take your seat of consciousness, relax your senses and allow us to take you on a journey. We are the Intimate Strangers. Thank you for listening. John, you're scaring me, man. Um, okay. All right. So Wait, wait. I want to know why is that scaring you? Ironically, I've never been asked the question, what's a red flag for a man? I've been asked, what's a red flag for women? I've written books about it. I'm giving some advice to women. If you don't have a, if there's a man you're interested in, one red flag is if he doesn't have a job that's fulfilling to him, uh, run the other way. And so if you're looking to your partner for this huge support, you're not going to get it all the time. So you pull to yourself. You have to have a life separate from your partner. So you, in a sense, kind of like a cup filling up, and then you overflow with your partner. When I dated, I was considered what's called a keeper. So all the women wanted to do long-term, or go slow with me, because they didn't want to have it be a one-night stand. <laughs> See, there's a distinction between sharing and complaining. Complaining is I'm sharing my feelings in order for you to change your behavior. That's a complaint. Sharing, as opposed to complaining, is just talking about your feelings without the intent to change somebody. Women are always wanting me to give them the red flags by what's the issue with him, 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 him. And I think the big red flag is you, 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 which is to look inside yourself. Folks, Xavier Kasani here. You are listening to The Human Experience. And wow, what an episode that we have for you today, Dr. John Gray. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and we talk about everything relationship. Interesting subject, of course. Dr. Gray's work has been featured pretty much everywhere. Oprah, Dr. Oz Show, Today, CBS. Dr. Gray has been doing this for a long time. I found his answers resoundingly accurate is a good word i think to use so hopefully you enjoy this one thank you guys so much for listening the human experience is in session my guest for today is dr john gray john it is a pleasure sir welcome to the human experience well thank you so much i'm happy to spend this time with you I want to read the inside cover of your book, Beyond Mars and Venus, just because I, I don't think that you'll name drop this. I want to do this for you. John Gray, PhD, is the author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. USA Today listed Mars, Venus as one of the top 10 most influential books of the last quarter century. I just want to jump into this, but I also want to know for you, 
How was this a draw for you? How did you feel a gravity towards relationships and men and women and their focus? Well, I was a celibate monk for nine years in my 20s. My brother was bipolar and uh, I was teaching meditation. And it really didn't help my brother very much. So I quit being a monk and went off to study psychology, thinking that maybe I could help him that way. I ended up teaching nutrition as well, because that actually does help. But uh, my movement from uh, personal growth through meditation moved into psychology, uh, primarily because when I went back to study psychology, I was very talented in understanding and counseling men and women. And my whole message of Mars Venus was because at the time, and it's still the case to some degree, people kept assuming that men and women uh, need the same kind of support, that we're all the same. And that's obviously not true. And people continue to think that our differences are just manufactured by cultural conditioning. While that is also true, that certainly our culture affects us, the purpose of culture is to support people in being the best they can be. And right now we're in a transition of creating a new culture that supports both men and women uh, being all that they can be, which is meaning that we're no longer limited to sexual stereotypes. But at the same time, we truly are very, very different in many significant ways, which is what I explain. And even when I talk about men and women, we're not talking all men. We're talking most of men and most of women. And there's always going to be exceptions. So the cultural differences are part of it, but we are integrally different. What is the dynamic when you're counseling a couple? Is, is there a certain dynamic that you notice most frequently that's happening between the two people? Well, people often ask me where I got my ideas for a minute from Mars, and it was right from counseling. All of, all of women's complaints of the women who came to me had the same complaints about men, and men had, had different complaints. I mean, literally. So people say, how do you know this is true? I said, well, for 10 years, and this is 30 years ago, uh, I counseled eight hours a day. And literally, every woman who came into my office, when, I, when they felt safe to talk about what was most important to them, basically had the same complaints about their husbands. And men had different complaints about their wives. You know, certainly there's many of those complaints, but one of the biggest ones for women was men don't listen. And, you know, a man listening might say, well, my wife doesn't listen to me. And I say, well, that's true. But it's not one of your biggest complaints. Men typically come in complaining that their wives don't listen only in response to their wife saying, well, you don't listen to me. And so he says, well, you don't listen to me. And they're both true. But it's not a man's biggest complaint. He comes in. His number one complaint is my wife's not happy. You know, she, nothing's ever good enough for her. She's uh, always complaining. And that's going to be the number one complaint men have, which is that women Basically, he's doing his best, and in her mind, it's not good enough. She's not happy. And from a woman's point of view, she doesn't feel heard. She doesn't feel seen. She, doesn't, she feels neglected. She feels not important. She feels he's not listening. She feels he's not the guy she married. He's less interested in her and more interested in his work or his children or whatever. So how important do you think it is to be fulfilled within oneself before someone is pursuing another person or a relationship or looking externally for some sort of validation to validate themselves? How important that is that? that? That is essentially the foundation of any good relationship, particularly romantic relationship, is to feel that you are happy and fulfilled on your own and your partner only adds to your fulfillment, not that you're dependent on them for your fulfillment. And again, that's going to be a gender difference. Uh, for men, they really need to get their fulfillment from their work. I'm giving some advice to women. If you don't have a, if there's a man you're interested in, one red flag is if he doesn't have a job that's fulfilling to him, uh, run the other way. Uh, the second one, you know, he's saying, oh, you make me happy. My job is awful. That's really a, a not a good sign. And the other side of this is women who find their fulfillment primarily from their work. First of all, they, they should be fulfilled within themselves as well, a man wants to find, and the woman who's going to be most successful in her relationship has a personal life that's very fulfilling to her. She has a personal life, not necessarily a work life that's, uh, you know, drives her and she's passionate about it. That, that's okay. That's good. But there needs to be, she needs to have time off from work where she's being personally fulfilled through her friendships, through her children through her relationship with nature or with God or with education. 
So it's not just all work oriented. This is really significant that we find a, a place of happiness within ourselves. Then, practically speaking, without sort of being a cliche, on the days when your partner's just in a bad mood, you're not looking to them. You can't look to them for anything. You have to give more to them at those times. Sure. And instead, people usually just get un unhappy about it and get upset. Why aren't you attending to my needs? Uh, why aren't you in a good mood? Why aren't you uh, focused on me? You were when I married you. What happened? Well, what happened is that person has had a bad day. You know, they have problems. Everybody has problems sometimes. And so if you're looking to your partner for this huge support, you're not going to get it all the time. So you pull to yourself. You have to have a life separate from your partner. So you, in a sense, kind of like a cup filling up, and then you overflow with your partner. Men feel that, you know, if my wife is happy, I'm happy. And, oh, that's a true experience. It's healthier to think my job is not to make her happy. My job is to make her happier. She's got to find the baseline. Uh, and I've got to have my baseline of happiness so that I'm not always looking to my wife to fill me up. I love that. I, I truly love that. And I believe in it myself. I, I think it's so important that people are you know, fulfilled within themselves before they attempt to get into this super romantic drama relationship, what, whatever it is. And it, it seems to me like people are sort of chasing this. They, they want a relationship. They want to fall in love. They want to get married. There's a, there's a sort of ideation that's happening. Do you notice this? Well, I think what you're saying is true. I have a little bit of a practical suggestion that kind of conflicts with that, but really it's right in line with that. We're talking about the foundation of a great relationship. But then there's this thing called dating. Uh, you do not have to be totally fulfilled in yourself to benefit from dating, companionship, getting to know people, practicing relationship skills. That's really a key as well. Because, you know, you, you might think that you're fulfilled in life. You might think that. Then you get in a relationship and then you find you have all these troubles. Uh, so what you have to do is recognize that, okay, if I'm having all these troubles, it's because I was fooling myself. I thought I was completely fulfilled, but I'm not. <laughs> You kind of have to have, you know, some uh, resistance before you recognize your problems. Uh, a lot of people walk around in denial and I love myself. I'm happy with myself. I really don't care what other people think. Boom. Now you get into a relationship and you suddenly start caring what other people think. And we should care about what other people think, but we shouldn't let it bring us down. Uh, that's the problem with it. When we care too much. Everything's about balance in life. And so I recommend people, even if they're not fulfilled inside. Uh, dating is one form of life, you know, taking a class and something's another, but not looking for your soulmate at that point. What you're doing is, is seeking to have a series of positive dating experiences to help you uh, get in touch with that part of you that wants a relationship, that can have a relationship. But the problem is this sort of desperateness people get into. That's going to be a turnoff and that sabotages a relationship. Let me give you an example. Hmm. If you were to buy my house, your brain would shift gears into uh, looking to see about the foundation. Does it have uh, mold behind the walls? Uh, is it how, how, when was it built? All these sort of issues come up if you're thinking about buying something. But if you're just visiting my house, you go, oh my gosh, such a beautiful home. How nice, how nice. And that's the way people should look towards dating is to have experience learning to communicate, learning to be intimate, learning to share, learning to, in a practical sense, Men learning to provide for women what makes them happy on a date, and women learning how to be happy on a date. <laughs> That's the dynamic, is we have to practice these things. And, you know, in my books, I explain a lot of stuff about how women can get more in relationships, how men can get more in relationships. But you want to practice these skills when there's not, you know, uh, the perfect person there, because if you fail, oh, it's a disaster. But if you've got training wheels, so to speak, it's okay to, to fall one way or the other. You're not going to hit the ground. Okay. That makes a lot of practical sense, and I, I agree with that. Is there a period that you would suggest where a person is just simply working on themselves? Yeah, I, I have no judgment against that at all. Uh, everybody's different in their journey in life. For me, from the age uh, 19 to 28, I was working on myself. I was a celibate monk. I actually think that was the foundation of my great success today. People always ask me, 
you know, what are your great marketing skills to be such a you know, famous person and, you know, happily married, all these things. They always want to know, how do you do it? Well, the foundation of it is kind of what we're talking about. I was basically learned how to be happy and fulfilled on my own. Uh, my only reason for not being a monk was to come out and help my brother. And then I realized I had a talent and a gift to help the world. So th there's always in everybody's lifetimes where you just need to work on yourself. That sounds great. So we mentioned red flags. On both sides, what are some main red flags for, you know, what are some things that men should look out for and what are some things that women should look out for? Well, I'll start with women. Women are always wanting me to give them the red flags by what's the issue with him, 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 him. And I think the big red flag is you, 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 which is to look inside yourself and question how you feel in the person's presence. That's a really big one. I mean, there's obvious ones. If he's a drug addict, run the other way. You know, if he doesn't have a job and looking to you for money, uh, run the other way. Uh, the, uh, if he's just uh, dangerous, run the other way. If he's married, run the other way. Particularly if he's unavailable type guy and you're really turned on to him, run the other way. Some women get turned on to unavailable men. That's just the way they're designed, just like some men get turned on to unavailable women. Mm -hmm. You know, every time you look at a porn video or something, it's an unavailable woman. You know, people say, why would you get turned on to an unavailable person? Well, just go by your experience. Uh, there is a whole psychological foundation for that, which is that if as a child, for a woman, if you, you didn't feel you had your father's attention and affection, there can be a wound there that causes you to always try to seek out men who are not available because your father's not available and try to make them love you. And so as an adult woman, you, you know that if you show a lot of sexual interest in a guy, he's gonna love you more. I mean, men are attracted to women who have short skirts. We all know that, that's why women wear short skirts, but it doesn't mean he's gonna want you the next day. That's the dynamic here. Hmm. So the more insecure a man is, the more he's turned on to sexually available women. Because the, the male energy is to pursue and if you don't have any sort of confidence in yourself, then you find a woman who's sexually available to you. Uh, you go, wow, okay, this is great. You know, builds up your confidence. So, but back to women with the red flags. The most important red flag I would suggest to women is if you have a history of unavailable men, meaning that you got involved, had sex, he didn't call you back, and another guy, another guy, another guy. In that situation, you should stop trusting your body response, which means that if you have a you meet a guy and you're turned on right away. I, I presume that was the case with these other guys. And you're, you're so excited and, and, and have a sexual feeling. Usually that's that pattern you've got. And you need to realize that's a red flag if you're super turned on right away. Because the truth is, you don't even know the guy. Mm -hmm. and you're, you you want to merge with him? Come on. Give sure. me a big deal. That's for women, not for men. Men can be turned on all the time if that's not a problem. We'll get to men in a moment. But for women... The big red flag is if you find that you're pursuing him more than he's pursuing you. Big red flag. If you feel you have to give more to get his attention, if you're really sort of motivated to get him and have to take actions to get him, uh, it's usually a red flag. What you want is a man who's motivated to take action for you. That's the guy you want. You want the guy who wants you more than you want him and then through the dating process, you find out that you want him just as much. So there's a journey there of learning to get to know somebody and falling more deeply in love. Mm -hmm. You know, this is fantasy thing. You fall in love right away. It can happen and it can be real. But you want to really let time test it out as you really get to know the person, find out the person. Do you really still love them so much? Now, for men, red flags. How do you feel when you're in the presence of a woman? Does she inspire you to give more? Okay. Now, sexual attraction certainly has to be there right away for a guy. Different for women. Women don't have to feel sexual attraction right away. They feel an interest, a caring, a wanting to get to know him, a being uplifted by his presence. It's not so much sexual, but it's more intellectual, uh, interesting. So we could divide the body into head, heart, and waste. And in that situation, men start the waist, go to the heart, then to the head. Women start in the head, then they go to the heart, then they go to the waist. That's a nice progression, quite common in women and men who have successful relationships. Mm -hmm. So a man has to have, of course, a sexual attraction to a woman right away. A. B. The next step is that 
he makes sure that there's a feeling of I have to sacrifice a whole lot to win her love. You don't want to have to sacrifice too much to win a woman's love, but you want to be able to feel automatically motivated to give more to her. You have sort of a natural acceptance and a lack of judgmentalness towards her. Those are like really key things. If you find yourself being picky, you find she's being really picky with you, run the other way. So there's a few few ideas. Hmm, okay, I like I like those ideas. Thank you for sharing those. I think... Well, let me let me give you another one. I'm just thinking okay. about. Okay. Another one from the man's point of view. It it's uh, ironically I've never been asked the question what's a red flag for a man. <laughs> I've been asked what's a red flag for women. I've written books about it. Uh, the, red flag <laughs> for, the red flag for men is uh, when you feel a woman selling herself on you rather than you want to sell yourself to her. Okay, I'll say it again. If a woman's really coming on to you and making you love her, so to speak, mm. uh, women can seduce men. When the woman seduces you, run the other way. What you want is a woman that gives you confidence that you can seduce her. That would be the clarity that oh, I have. Oh, man, John, you're scaring me, man. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. So Wait, wait. I want to know why is that scaring you? No, I just, you know, looking at the relationships that I've been in and, you know, in, in your book, you say that differences attract. and uh, what I find is that the women that I attract into my life are very hero seeking. Like they're they're looking to be fixed in some way, or there's something so deeply troubled or wrong that there's a relationship isn't really possible. And it's it's very passionate and quick when we meet, so it's it's very fast. So it's I'm I'm hitting all of your red flags, I all see. of those flags. Okay, all right, got it. Okay, so you know, I want to I want to progress a little bit further. Okay, so let's say that a man and woman find each other and they're they're clicking, they're dating, things are going well. What would you say is the normal progression of a relationship? What is the the normal pace of a relationship? You know, I'm a a guy, so I feel like I'm betraying all men when I say this, but you want to go slow. Uh, part of our job sort of instinctively as men is to go fast and it's our job to open the doors to get in there and her job is to not let you open the door until she's ready for this door then this door then this door so the awareness is if you have a history whether you're a man or woman of having these really short flings and they're not turning out well and you want it to turn out well okay there's a distinction here remember we talked about the person who's working on themselves and so forth If they want to have short flings, fine. You know, I'm no, not, there's nothing wrong with that. It's human nature. You want some companionship. You want some intimacy. You want some sex. If your person, other person's into that, it's consensual, great. But usually that doesn't lead to, and I'm just saying usually, there's always exceptions to everything, doesn't lead to long-term relationships. When I dated, I was considered what's called a keeper. So all the women wanted to do long-term, or go slow with me, because they didn't want to have it be a one-night stand. But if you're just looking for, you know, fun, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. At the same time, it's not going to create a long lasting relationship for you. You go slow, you get a chance uh, to experience more and more of the person you're dating. And then your body and your mind and your heart can see, is this the person for you and has time to adjust to this being the person for you? Because there's nobody's ever perfect. It's a mistake to think that you're going to find someone. Everything's always going to fit together perfectly. It's always going to be harmonious. As a matter of fact, something you said a little while ago reminded me of a phenomenon that men have a lot. Hmm. I was, uh, I'll just tell the story. It was a fun story. I, was, I had a limo driver, and he heard, you know, he saw it was John Gray, Men from Mars, all that. And he said, yeah, I'm just sort of jinxed in relationships. You know, I said, oh, how many relationships have you had? He says, well, you know, five significant relationships. And I said, well, were these women you really wanted to have a real relationship with? And he says, yeah, I want to be married, have children, have a family. And I said, so let me, don't tell me anything more. Let me describe what your relationships look like. In the beginning, it was really wonderful and she was very appreciative and everything was harmonious. And you started having sex and the sex was great and you thought, wow, this could be the one. And then it seemed like she went crazy. It's like she had all these problems and she started, you know, talking about problems all the time. And you felt like, oh my God, this lady's crazy. She needs therapy. And he goes, my God, how did you know? How did you know? I say, well, if you don't understand women, for most men, they seem crazy. But why would she have so many problems? I said, they all have problems. Life is problems. It's just women want to talk about them. 
but they don't necessarily want to talk about them until after you've been intimate, and then they feel safe. And when they feel safe, they start bringing up issues. Men, they don't know. What they need to do is learn how to listen and not try to solve their problems because they don't need you to solve their problems. And many of those problems don't need to be solved. They just need to be heard, understood, uh, feel a little empathy, and then they feel good again. So literally, this guy made, made all these women uh, go crazy because he didn't know how to listen and didn't know how to validate after being more intimate with them. It usually happens after you've been more intimate, where women's uh, sort of unresolved issues come up, A, or just simply she feels safe to talk about the things she feels inside. Because you have to realize women are not like men. We'll use the cup example again. Let's say it's half full. And some people look at the cup being half full. Some people look at the cup as being half empty. The ones that see the cup as half full are in denial. And the one that sees the cup as half empty, they're always unhappy. So women have the potential, really, to see the whole cup. They really see a lot more than men do. Men can basically be pretty happy and fulfilled in denial. But women, <laughs> women who are in denial will open up and suddenly they start seeing, once they have sex and they start to feel safe with you, they'll open up and then the, the cup suddenly is half empty. So this is something men have to learn about women, which is that they're more like the weather and, and they're unpredictable and sometimes they're storming, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's freezing cold. And, you know, you don't have to be a victim to that. You just have to have good relationship skills. So if it's raining, I have an umbrella. You know, if it's cold, I have a jacket. If it's hot, you know, I have shorts. You, know, you just adapt to the situation because you can do this if you have the skills, which most people don't have the skills, A. And B, the, which you brought out in the beginning, is the foundation of a good relationship, is you have to be able to come from this happier place inside, more fulfilled place. And to be less perfectionist, we could just say less needy. The bottom line, in my book, Beyond Mars and Venus, I teach men masculinity is not complaining, period. You can go to guys and make jokes about complaints. You can ask what you want. You can say what you like. But to complain and whine is total turn off to woman. And to argue and fight her, oh my God, you're going to turn off and kill the sex drive in her. And it happens to most couples. Just because women get angry, so men go, if you're angry, I'm angry. You know, If you're going to complain, I'm going to complain. It's kind of like this ping pong match. Sure. Uh, and it, it's here, let me give you an example of it. You, you have a, a woman come in with a lot of complaints and she wants a divorce. Man, I talked to him privately. I said, so what's the deal here? What's the point? Give me the, give me the big problem. And one sentence, he says, she's not happy. If she's happy, everything would be fine. And that really is the big point for men. Uh, we just want a happy wife to a certain extent. Our needs are much less. Our needs are greater when it comes to our career and our work. Uh, our needs for relationship become enormous when we're not getting it. But the bottom line is what we need most is to feel we're providing for her happiness, that we're providing and make a difference in her life. Whereas for her, it's a little bit more complex. She needs to feel that we do make a difference in her life. And that's a big challenge for women because women, you know, when they don't get what they need, they go into their male side and they assert themselves, which is, all right, but I'm not going to wait on him. I'll just do it myself. And then, okay, if he can't do it right, then I'll just do it myself. Well, if you don't want to help me, well, I'll just do it myself. Well, if you don't want to go and do that, I'll just do it myself. A little of that's fine, but they just go into that. I'll just do it myself. And now they're men. You know, the man, the male ego, the male sense of self, the self-esteem comes from, look what I can do. And the female sense of self comes from, look what I have, look what I can get. The female power, which women are losing, They've, they're just so unhappy today. First of all, it's the power to be happy. Second, it's the power to get other people to do stuff for you. So you're not doing everything all the time. The number one complaint women have, this is the number one complaint women have in their lives, not about men, it's about them, their life, is they're overwhelmed. There's too much, quote, to do. There's not too much to do. That's the world you created. You choose your life, which, oh, there's so much to do. There's so much to do. I, I don't have time for myself. Yes, you do. But they can't, they can't find it and they need help to do it. And that's why I've written a whole book is help them let go of this unhappiness, sleeplessness that they get from being too far on their male side. When women's male hormones become greater and their female hormones become less, that happens by the choices you make. I give women the right choices. When you make those choices to come back to your feminine hormones, you're happier, you're more fulfilled. Uh, you may not choose to run for president because it's a pretty tough job. I mean, you said, what is it, 12, 15 hour job? Uh, you working all the time just destroys your female hormones. Mm. Female hormones are produced when you're relaxed, when you're happy, when you're nurturing, when you're loving, when, you're, when life is graceful and fluid. 
uh, male hormones get produced when life is tough, it's dirty, it's dangerous, and you do the hard stuff and you don't complain about it. Mm. Now, those are extremes, okay? I'm, I'm just talking extremes. Mm. Uh, I like comfort. I, I go to five star hotels. I've got a great car. I got a beautiful home. I got a great sex with my wife. That's all my female side did that. So what we want in life is a balance of both. Where I see the dysfunction happens is, and it's happening rampantly today, is that men are too emotional and women are too work oriented. They're too detached. Many women listening to this program right now are saying, "Why can't I fall in love with a guy? Nobody's good enough." You're on your male side. You're on your male side. You need to come back to your female side where you're receptive and open and more loving. You're happier. Then what happens is you find men are more attractive. You find yourself being more accepting. And you find yourself being more appreciative. And you find yourself a good partner. So, Dr. Ray, let me let me just pause you there. I apologize for interrupting you. But okay, That's so, okay. I was so, <laughs> so, okay, so there's so much to process in all of that. Uh, so I, w- I want to know, you know, is does this come down to just neurochemicals and also, for a woman, is it about letting the man help her? Is that an issue you see as well? Well, that's two questions. First is neurochemicals. Nothing is just neurochemicals. The, the body is really a projection of your spirit. But your spirit functions through this body. And the body, we look, talk about the differences between men and women. It's very simple. You know, if you're, and this moves into the answer to the next question, is it a matter of letting a man do something for you? Yes. Anybody can do this experiment. Uh, ask someone to do something for you. <laughs> or even better, have someone offer. You know, you can't do this, but next time somebody offers something for, to do for you that you can do yourself, say, sure, go ahead, thank you. Notice how your body changes. Your hormones change when you let someone do something for you. Something that you can do on your own. Now, certainly if it's something you can't do on your own, more female hormones will get produced. But even when somebody makes a gesture to do something for you. Like what's the old, what are some of the standard romantic things? It's uh, going and getting flowers for a woman. Okay, she can buy flowers. What's the big deal? No, if he buys flowers, it has a different reaction than when she buys them at the grocery store. Uh, second, you go on a date together and he opens the car door for you. Well, you can open a car door. What's the big deal? But when he opens the car door, it's a consideration. It's a symbol. It's a gesture saying, you know, you're special. You're important. And really what it's saying is you do so much for so many people all day long. Tonight, let me do things for you. That's romance. Why is it called romance? Because it stimulates estrogen. Estrogen levels have to double in a woman's body before she can be romantic, have romantic feelings. And that's biology. But it's also spirit. It's also mind. The mind has to uh, recognize I don't have to do it all. Someone's doing this for me. I can trust this person. I appreciate this person. This person is nice. That's all mental stuff going on. But the reaction to all of that is hormonal changes. So it's never one thing. It's a two-way street, body, mind, heart, all that come together. Yeah. But you know, it, what's wonderful about understanding hormones is it's so physical. It's such reality. It's such a fact that a woman cannot have a climax unless her estrogen levels double, period, done. <laughs> so then you start going, okay, now what, what can create estrogen in a woman? Well, whenever a woman feels she needs help, and somebody helps her, her estrogen levels rise up. Now, if she doesn't feel she needs help, and you help a woman, they might rise up a little, but at least it's something, and you're moving in the right direction, which means letting herself depend on someone, which is scary for women today, particularly today, uh, because their whole self-esteem is all wrapped up in being like men. See how much money I can make, see what I can do, I'm independent. But it's an evolutionary shift here where women are not gonna be so dependent on men for survival and security. They're shifting into gears where they depend on men for emotional support. Uh, that's a new realm of relationships. Is it's all about the lack of or the abundance of emotional support that women and men need in order to go to a higher level of self-improvement, self-development. Uh, that would be referring back to Maslow's ideas of when you fulfill the lower needs, then higher needs become very significant. Sure. Yeah. Now... We're in a stage of development, particularly in the beginning of the American culture, uh, freedom. Uh, you know, everybody's equal and we want freedom. Well, that's a, that's a big, big thing. Huge evolutionary shift. And what we want in relationships is, particularly women, they want the freedom to be independent. And men, well, they're not as vocal about it, but men want the intimacy. These are our two higher needs before we get to enlightenment needs, is intimacy and independence. For women, they're seeking out what they've had to suppress, which is independence. And men are moving towards what they've had to suppress, which is being emotional. 
but men are too emotional now. They become too needy, too dependent on things to make them happy, like drugs and pornography and junk food and all that, uh, alcohol. You get too dependent, you become weak. Uh, whereas <clears throat> women are wanting to become too independent. It's the lack of balance. And we can see on a biological level what that balance looks like. It's like a man, I have to have at least 30, 40 times more testosterone than a woman. Otherwise, I'd be depressed and have a heart attack. When men's testosterone levels go down, their libido goes away, their motivations in life become away, they start to want to retire, they don't want to work so hard, uh, they become more emotional, more depressed. Uh, and this is, of course, what's happening with men all over the world today due to pesticides and toxicity. I write, write books on all that, too. These, you know, people don't even know pesticides are hormones. You're taking hormones. So when you eat meat in the junk food meat, fast food meat, that's all hormones in there. They put the hormones in the cattle, it goes right in your body. And for men, these hormones suppress your testosterone. For women, they throw their hormones out of balance and keep women from feeling the need to make hormones. Uh, and which causes women to feel that, that they don't have needs for a man, they don't have needs for romance, they don't have needs for connection. They're just in denial of a very part of them, which is not psychological denial. Literally, their body is not sending the right messages to the brain. Hmm. Okay, wow. It's a lot to absorb and take in. You, you know, what I'm hearing the most is that a lot of the proportion between, you know, a healthy, balanced relationship is First and foremost, the internal balance that we, we all should have before seeking a partner, but also communication and how we're communicating and listening to each other, both men and women. Yeah, not listening for men, appreciating for men. You said it wonderfully, but I just want a subtlety distinction. I just got back from nine days in China. And when I get home, first thing my wife did is, I'm so happy to see you. And she had a big smile and she's so happy I'm there. It doesn't mean she doesn't have all issues to bring up, you know, with we got lights have to be fixed, certain things have to be changed, there's certain bills have to be paid, all those problems. She's not going to present me with that. She's just going to present me with that pure happiness that you had when you were dating a woman and she's just so happy to see you and had such fun. She's going to greet me with that. She's not in denial of the other things. We'll get to that. But, you know, it's upon greeting each other. It's such a key thing that men need to feel that hero energy, which is that I am important to her in her life. She needs to feel she's important to me. So I find her. I call her right when I get to the airport. You know, I'm here. I'm safe. Everything's fine. And of course, I've done it every day by email. Well, one of the things women need is to know where their partner is at all times. <laughs> They'll have a GPS thing. So I'll send her notes and send her little things, including her in my life, that she is a part of my life and letting her know she's more important than anybody else. And certainly when she starts to bring up issues, I, I'll hear. It was so sweet last night after not being in, home for nine days. I come back and uh, the season's coming on and I'm, I'm uh, listening to my wife. One of our daughters is there. Must have had like a three hour discussion on everything which is going on. And I'm not in that role of trying to be the fix it, solve it, but asking more questions. That's what women need most, is men who like converse by mainly asking questions and showing interest in what they have to say. And then what you say, you try to be more supportive rather than uh, try to fix them or change them or whatever. And my wife's very careful not to do the same with me. You know, this complaining stuff, she rarely, rarely complains if they are the little things. And if there's something big, she'll ask. You know, a complaint is just a, a frustrated request, basically. it's it's a poor communication skill to complain. You know, if you complain, you're late. Why are you always late? Well, that's just a negative message that will push a man's testosterone down, as opposed to next time, I really appreciate if you come on time or at least call me. It makes a big difference for me. Such a different way of communicating. For men to learn to communicate towards women, the message, I care, I understand, and I respect you. And I've written huge chapters on each of those three words. You know, men are always the one who got the respect, but actually women need the respect more. When you respect someone, estrogen goes up, ironically. When you appreciate someone, testosterone goes up. When you forgive someone's mistakes, when you're very uh, accepting of person who they are, your testosterone goes up. When if you're being punished, if you're getting disapproval, if you're having somebody complaining about you, testosterone goes down. Uh, someone can depend on you, ask for help, they trust you, they 
woman can feel this is the guy I can depend on, not for everything. See, that's where it becomes a problem is women think, well, he didn't do this. Well, I can't trust him. No, you can. Of course, you can trust him. There's other things you can trust him for. You can't trust him for everything. Uh, but we go to these extremes as people all or nothing. Another problem in relationships. That's a lot of information. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> no. No worries. It, this is uh, in my book Beyond Mars and Venus. I tackle these ideas of how all of all of our behaviors and whatever either stimulate male hormones, female hormones, and so then it becomes very clear that for a man. But when you're upset, you're always too far on your female side, period. Therefore, what can you do that will increase your male side? And so, and simply put, anything you're good at is going to raise your testosterone. So if you're upset with your partner, forget it and do something you're good at. Stop talking to her. The worst thing you can ever do when you're upset is talk. And couples do this all the time because they think talking is the answer to everything. No, when your heart is open, then talking is wonderful. But if your heart's not open, it's closed. Well, when your heart is closed, always there's a hormonal imbalance going on in your body. Men's testosterone levels are literally going down and estrogen is being produced. That's biological. When women's heart is closed, their testosterone is going up and their estrogen is going down. Therefore, if a woman's upset with a man, she must do something that will increase her estrogen. Talking is really good, but not to a man. You talk about your complaints to another woman. You talk about your complaints to somebody you're not upset with. And then it's no longer a complaint. It's a sharing. See, there's a distinction between sharing and complaining. Okay. Complaining is I'm sharing my feelings in order for you to change your behavior. That's a complaint. Sharing, as opposed to complaining, is just talking about your feelings without the intent to change somebody. It's very hard for women to share their feelings with a guy without the intent to change him if her heart is closed. Like, if you have a chance, I'd really love it if you do this. It'd be really nice if you did that. This feels better when you call me and don't and do this. You, you don't feel any sort of emotion-packed demand. And most women can't do that. So they just can't. So the beginning steps to do that is... When you're upset and you feel this demanding quality inside of you, then you go and talk to a girlfriend about it and just share and she'll give you some support. And then you feel your hormones will change. Just sharing without trying to change somebody will increase her estrogen. That will actually open her heart, period. So there's certain things we can do biologically, behaviors that trigger our biology. Then when the biology changes, we're able to do those behaviors that we know will work. You see, when your heart is closed, you can't do the behaviors that will work in terms of talking to your partner. You can say the exact words I just said, like a non-demanding request. You can use the words, but if your heart is closed, it comes across as a demand. Everybody knows that. You can hear it in the tone of voice. They, the experts say, uh, you know, this is not my expertise, just read this in many, many books, that you know, 80, 90% of the message you give to somebody is all in the tone of voice. Sure. And we got a couple questions that came in. Um, People want to know, this this comes from Bangor. Uh, They want to know, is a relationship more successful if the female is the dominant partner? I I don't think you can uh, say that's a major factor in a relationship. We're looking at equality in a relationship. There's all kinds of relationships. There's, There's if a woman's a dominant and a guy's a submission, submissive and he likes that, that that's okay. Uh, it, it's what you like and what your preference is. Dominant, however, tends to imply masculine energy. Now, you could be dominant and not have masculine energy and be very feminine, which is very clear about what you like and what you want. That's often considered dominant. But actually, if it's done without demand, it's very feminine. So I'm going to step out of the world of how people interpret dominant and step back into my interpretation of masculine and feminine, is if a woman is on her feminine side, uh, you're going to have a great relationship. If a woman's in her masculine side, you're going to have a crummy relationship. And dominant could be coming from feminine or from masculine. Uh, I do want to make a little comment. There's a, there's a thing you hear all the time from people who've been married for 30, 40 years, as, and they say, what's the secret of your sex success? And guys will say, uh, you know, I just learned to say yes to everything she says. Okay, yeah, what you know is on the surface they stayed married all those years, but what's happening in the bedroom? Probably nothing. Uh, everybody's different. Some people are okay with that, and that's fine. But 
the younger generation and my generation, who I am, I want I want great sex. I want great passion. I not just harmony in the relationship, but also passion. And sometimes we sacrifice passion in order to create harmony. And men can do this much easier than women. Just well, women can do it too. Just deny, deny, deny. Just go, yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, whatever you want. Yeah, whatever you want. Uh, that's going to kill his sex drive. And if that's okay with them, that's fine. And that is okay with lots of couples. If you look at married couples, most of them don't have sex after 10, 20 years. Hmm. Uh, that's just what's happening. Not okay with me. And, and so look at this massive porn addiction. I mean, porn is ridiculous to me. I laugh at it because I've got the real thing. I mean, literally, if you're satisfied in your relationship with a real woman, you don't need porn. And it looks silly because they're just acting and it's all just fake. Why would I want to be with somebody who's not real? But Men don't have this quality relationship I'm talking about, so then porn becomes like an addiction. Hmm. Okay, uh, this one comes from Tides, if I'm saying that correctly. With the changes going on in society, I feel as though women have to be more aggressive, uh, demonstrate more masculine traits. Any suggestions on how to hack female biology to become more aggressive Less nurture, more creator slash fixer. <laughs> I'm the expert on just the opposite. Uh, I wrote a whole book on just the opposite. Uh, women today, how to come back to their feminine side is really the challenge for women today. If you really felt you could trust others and you were uh, felt supported in your life, uh, there'd be no problem asserting yourself. Uh, women only become aggressive and assertive because they're weak on their female side. You know, this person doesn't feel safe being female. Therefore, I have to become male to get ahead. You don't have to become male to get ahead. You do have to learn some good communication skills of how men operate in the workplace. Uh, but the actual energy of success for women is the more you suppress your female, the harder you're going to work and the less results you're going to get. It's our female energies that attract success. Our female energies attract opportunities. Uh, female energies attract a big yes from other people. That's what you want, and that's the success in the world. And women are becoming more successful in the world. There's no doubt about it. Uh, however, their health and their happiness levels are going down because they're not able to, you know, over time, they get too far over to their male side, cannot come back to their female side. So uh, I really don't write books on how women can be more aggressive. or I do write books on how to be more assertive. So one simple thing is learn how to ask without demanding. Uh, you can, instead of saying to a guy, you know, you should do this, uh, say, would you do this? Uh, instead of saying to a guy, hey, could you do that? The guy will say, yeah, but then forget to do it. If you want him to remember to do it, you say, would you? Would you is a very vulnerable thing. Uh, could you pick up my clothes at the cleaners? And you say, uh, no, I can't. Uh, you don't feel any sort of rejection because they're saying they really can't do it. But if you say, will you pick up the, my clothes at the cleaners? You're really making a request, and if he turns you down, uh, it's like he's rejecting you. So would you is a much more vulnerable thing, and vulnerability is femininity. I just highly suggest women, if you want more success in the world, learn how to be successful as a woman, and success will come to you as opposed to running after it. Love that. Love that answer. Um, okay, so one or two more questions, uh, Dr. Gray. Uh, you, you spoke about the spiritual aspect of things earlier. I want to know about this term twin flames, soulmates. There's this sort of romantic notion that is ascribed to these two ideations of this perfect romance that just falls into your lap. What has created that within our culture, within our society, to bring it sort of full circle? What has created that in our minds? Is it watching TV? Is it movies? Well, it's, it's a it's a thousand year old uh, concept. Thousands of years, people believe this to be the case: is that there's this compliment to you that you're destined to meet and fall in love with and live a life with. Uh, you know, I can contribute to that. You know, as a monk for nine years, I'm, I have all the esoteric experiences, and, and I really don't teach this a lot. But since you asked the question, you know. I remember many past lives, and I also remember life between lives. And I do remember before this life. I don't remember it so clearly, just like I just went to China. I don't remember all the details of what just happened, but I have these certain experiences from the trip that I can remember. 
same thing with past lives, significant moments and whatever. And I do remember uh, planning to be married to my wife, Bonnie. So she is a soulmate. A soulmate is someone that you sort of are destined to be with. However, I was with Bonnie. Uh, I first met Bonnie. She was married to somebody else. And then I'm, and you know, she's very nice, a sweet lady. Then at another time, I, when I was no longer a monk, I met her again and had an affair with her that lasted a couple of years. And she already had two little children and I really wasn't into having kids. So we didn't get married. Then I married somebody else. And then that lasted a couple of years. And I just called up Bonnie one day and bingo, right then when I talked to her, I heard her voice. I remembered at that point, I heard bells ringing. And now it wasn't like bells ringing, it's heavenly music. Part of the thing for me as a yogi, meditator i used to fast and listen to go into deep meditations for days without eating and then i would go into an altered state where i would hear the music of the universe which is very very beautiful it's kind of heavenly music you might say and so when i heard her voice this time i did hear the music and i did have the brief memory of we're going to come together so there are certain things that are destined so one might think of that as a soulmate and that's why those things are there there are people in the past who've had experiences like that so having said that, uh, I'll come back to being practical teacher that I am. My book, Beyond Mars Venus, I talk about role mate versus soulmate. And in that, I don't talk about a predetermined relationships or so forth, because that's not most people's belief system. However, I do talk about role mates. Role mates are when the man basically does male stuff and the woman basically does female stuff. And there's no, there's no crossing over the divide. Men are men, women are women. Men are the providers, women are the homemakers, men are tough, women are soft, you know, all that, you know, stereotypical male-female stuff. That's a role, you have a role to play. Man's role is to be the provider, woman's role is to be the loving, nurturing partner. Okay, now we've got something called soulmate, which I define as not necessarily your destined partner and so forth. That's a different belief system than most people have. But in a practical sense, soulmate is a partner that's that has the ability and the willingness and the skills to support you in expressing your authentic self, all of who you are. Uh, we have a soul that comes more fully into play when we express all parts of who we are. To a certain extent, relationships in the past had less soul. This is more soul means more authentic self, which means for women to experience both the freedom of their independence along with the vulnerability and sensitivities of their emotional side, the intimacy that can occur. And for men, the freedom to experience their, their more intimate, vulnerable self, along with their independent self. So simple said, for men to be both masculine and feminine, according to your own unique balance, and for women to be both masculine and feminine in their own unique balance, and having a relationship that supports you and both those qualities, that would be a soulmate relationship. So I like that definition. It's very practical. Twin flame, many people refer to twin flame as a couple who get together and their compatibility is that they have some goal uh, that they share and that they're very much the same in terms of maybe they're teachers and they love to go around and teach together. But maybe they're both artists and they love being in the art field together. They tend to be just like each other. They're more like each other. The soulmates are complements to each other. And I do see this as a reality out there. There's some couples that are more complements and some who are, who are you know, almost like brother, brother and sister, almost the same. But mostly what I teach is soulmate, which is how to embrace the differences when they show up in a positive way. Whereas the twin flames, they sort of, they come together to do some project on the planet or do some project in life together. Okay. Thank you so much for answering that. I felt like, you know, it's, it's been going around a lot and I, I, I wanted to clarify uh, a little bit more. You know, let me, let me interrupt because I really didn't answer your question, okay. which is the best, best part of your the question, which is yeah. the, the naive expectation that a soulmate is going to be always in harmony and perfect. Oh, okay. Or the naive expectation that your twin Flynn twin flame is that there's no challenges or problems in the relationship that's what throws everybody off you fall in love and you think just because you're deeply in love with someone that there's not going to be challenges it's like saying there's not going to be gravity if you live on planet earth there's going to be gravity 
if you're in an in, if you're in a marriage, there's going to be gravity. There's going to be challenges that allow you to become stronger, that allow you to become more loving. And ultimately, I believe we're really here as souls to learn love, uh, to become more loving. And let's say I come if I if I want to build muscle. I go to a gym and I don't pick up light weights. I pick up heavier and heavier and heavier weights. That's how you grow is through challenge. And if you want to grow in your ability to love, you get married and you overcome those challenges. If you don't get married, it's you don't really grow in love. It, you just go from one partner to another to another. Maybe you grow a little bit. But the big challenge is to keep coming back to love after somebody disappoints you. And every marriage, there'll be times when you're disappointed. Dr. Gray, wow, uh, such a so much learning, so much information, and we just scratched the surface. How can people find your work? How can people find Beyond Mars and Venus? Uh, give us that information, please. My website's marsvenus.com. Uh, Beyond Mars Venus, the new book, is probably in most bookstores. It's also on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. All those places have it. The uh, it's still in hardback. Uh, you can get every day different podcasts of me as well at marsvenus.com and most interesting is for women only lauren gray who's my adult daughter uh also teaches classes for women how to sustain your feminine energies while in a relationship with a man uh <laughs> that's tough and she really goes into the details of it the book about that is beyond mars and venus which i wrote but she teaches online coaching for women and that and that course so she does lots of video blogs that are free and people can watch those and i think uh, particularly women like them although online i check the uh, statistics and i see that more men watch them because she's always explaining women to men and men to women and to have a woman's point of view is sometimes better than a man's point of view very true dr gray thank you so much for your time we are going to get out of here folks thank you so much for listening you have been listening to the human experience my name is Xavier Katana. My guest, Dr. John Gray. Thank you guys so much for tuning in.